Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 921-MR421. Peter Williams, who boxed at 135 pounds. It's all right. It looked like your duty. Mrs. Jessie Fallowfield, his mother-in-law. It'll come out all right one of these days, I'm sure. Sir Brendan O'Neill, Home Office pathologist at Scotland Yard. We're doing the best we can do. Iris Williams, who resembled her mother. No, no, not to the police station. No. Chief Inspector Oscar Ford of Scotland Yard. On the morning of 19th November, 1943, two engineers employed by a Bedfordshire town discovered something floating, half submerged in the waters of the River Lee. Now, if you'll come with me down the corridor here to the Black Museum, I'll show you what they found. Come along, please. Now, this is Scotland Yard's Black Museum, of which you may have heard. Well, Chief Superintendent John Davison doesn't seem to be here. Well, John! Who is it? It's Austin Ford, John. Oh, be with you at once. Chief Superintendent Davison is the custodian of the Black Museum. Has a long and distinguished record with the Yard. Oh, good afternoon. Came in connection with the Williams case, John. Oh, yes. 921-MR-421. Up here on the shelf. See, I hope you're not too disappointed in not finding skeletons and gory human bodies lying about in here. But they're in short stock with us. Yeah, this is it, Oscar. Actually, this isn't the Grand Guino, you know. The articles filed away in here, all, of course, at some connection with one crime or another, but they're not particularly gory now. We don't keep them here to inspire writers of penny dreadfuls on the wireless at all. No, they're here for the use as reference items in our business of catching criminals. Examples, you see, of how certain crimes were committed. And I think you'd be amazed how much they aid our people in solving of other similar ones. Now, these things in this box are potato sacks. Ordinary rough burlap sacks. The potatoes come in. Other things come in them too, John. Yes, a dead body came in this one. Clammy rain mixed with snow had been falling all day when I arrived at the riverbank 40 miles north of London. And thanks to the inclement weather, no crowd had gathered. And the huge local constable, the unfortunate victim, and I had the dismal landscape all to ourselves. I showed my card to the constable. Thank you, sir. That's it? I wouldn't look if you don't need to, sir. Drowned, eh? Not only drowned, sir. Oh. Doctor's just left, sir. They'll be coming to take her to the mortuary. Her? He thinks it was a woman. It was, of course, patent that the woman had died a violent death, to use the old cliché, at the hands of a person or persons unknown. Our job was not only to find that person or persons unknown, but first to establish the identity of the unfortunate young woman who had worn potato sacks as her ultimate garment. A homicide is a very personal thing. The relations between victim and killer that exist before the deed are most important in discovering the latter. But lacking identification of the victim, it's most difficult to establish what relations ever existed between the late unlamented and any other person in the world. So one might think that the secret of successful murder is to render your victim unidentifiable. But don't try it. It can't be done. We'll catch you. Sir Brendan O'Neill, the Home Office pathologist, told me to what extent the killer had attempted to prevent identification of the victim and thus of himself. There are no fingerprints, of course. 
I, I suggest that you have the bottom of the river lead dragged at once. Already? See if you can find the missing hands. Already had that, Sir Brandon. No luck so far, though. Well, whoever she was, she wore false teeth, so there's no good trying that one. The teeth are missing, of course. Neither upper nor lower plate. Oh, they might be at the bottom of the river, too, in a foot of mud somewhere. Well, you'll never find them. I've never seen such a completely anonymous body in all my time, Oscar. No scars or moles, birthmarks, that sort of thing? Not a thing. I can tell you her height, though. Five feet, three inches. And her weight. Assuming that the missing arms weighed about 20 pounds, that'd make her 121 pounds. Say 120. Quite average brown hair, bobbed. Can't tell you what color her eyes were. No. Uh, We're trying to type her blood now. Afraid that's all. No, her age, sir? Oh, I'd say about 27. Oh, yes. And she'd had children. Well, it isn't much to go on, is it? Oh, best we can do, Chief Inspector. Oh, I know that, sir. Those wounds on her head. Mm, hit with something that has a sharp corner. Uh, smashed the skull in three places. Dead when she was thrown into the water. Well, we'll check every missing woman case up Bedfordshire way first. See if we can find out which 120-pound, 5-foot-3 woman is not accounted for. Mm, had children, dull, brown, bobbed hair. That's all of it. I should have listened to my father. Huh? He wanted me to be a parson, sir. Oh. Well, good luck. I'll bloody well need it, I muttered to myself as I closed the door. I didn't have any, though, for a long time. This is what we accomplished in the next six weeks. 534 lorry drivers known to have passed the riverbank where the body was found during the 24 hours previous to the finding of the body were investigated and screened. Result? Nothing. The movements of every soldier on day leave from the nearby army camps during that period were traced. Result? Nothing. Every war factory worker in the vicinity, in both day and night shifts, was questioned. Result? Absolutely nothing. 604 women throughout Britain who had been reported missing were checked on by Scotland Yard and Provincial Police. Result? All 604 women were found alive. The banks and bottom of the River Lee were searched for two miles in both directions from the place where the body was found. Results? Quantities of mud and useless debris. A photograph of the skull was given to an expert artist who carefully retouched it and to what we all hoped was a semblance of the dead woman's features. And we caused copies of this photograph to be handed from house to house in this market city of 70,000. We had the photograph exhibited on the screens at all the local cinemas. Thousands of persons saw this retouched picture in the weeks before Christmas 1943, including the murderer himself, we found out later. But the results were still nothing at all. On the day after Christmas, the coroner's order for the burial of the remains was signed. Case number 921-MR-421 was about to be stamped unsolved. As I was leaving the yard on the evening of that 26th, I ran into Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the Black Museum man. Have a good Christmas, sir, I asked. Not bad at all, Oscar. Very pleasant. You? I worked. What a pity. Understand they're burying that girl tomorrow. Well, I expect that's the end of it. Burying her up there in Bedfordshire, are they? Aye. Right. Going to the funeral? Well, sir, you'd hardly call it a funeral, exactly. You're going? Hardly, sir. Hmm. Oh, have a cigar? Canadian friend of mine sent me a box for Christmas. Real Corona Perfectos. Thank you, sir. Well, one more for me, then. I should think it would be an act of Christian charity if you did attend the girl's funeral. Well, sir, I... I remember once about 1909 or 10, if I remember correctly. I think it was old smudgy Steele, Inspector Steele, dead now. He nabbed a man at a funeral. That's so, sir. The murderer. Chap came to gloat, I expect, at his victim's last rites. Steele wondered who this stranger was and... Got into conversation with him. <laughs> Orson Welles or someone ought to get hold of that one. <laughs> Make a corking good penny dreadful, wouldn't it? The stranger at the funeral or something. <laughs> but it really happened. Might happen again, too, you know. Well, good night. Yes, uh, good night, sir.
And so I rode 40 miles to a market town on a dismal day after Boxing Day to a grimy little cemetery not far from one of the hat factories for which the town is celebrated. The two second assistant sextons were shoveling the frozen clods into the raw new grave as I walked away from there with the huge constable and the young army chaplain who had been summoned away from a nearby officer's mess to officiate. The cemetery was deserted except for us. The murderer hadn't been in attendance after all. The big constable and I walked on past the hat factory whilst the young chaplain left to go back to his unfinished lunch. It was cold, streets almost deserted. The policeman talked about the tug of war at the last summer's police game. I give you my word, sir. I never saw such a team as them blokes from the city police. Uh-huh. Not a man less than 15 stone amongst them. And coop blow, that anchor man. Well, that chap weighed not a pound less than 17 stone and strong. Oh, a ruddy bull. Name of Brian O'Brien from Galway originally. <laughs> I, I thought I should have died laughing, sir. <laughs> the way that belt nearly cut him in two. Yeah. He sunk them great eels in and he huffed and he puffed. Hey, what's the matter with you, young lady? Uh, nothing the matter with her voice. Oh, now, what's the matter, dear? I want my mummy. Oh, she's lost best take of the nearest police station, eh? Come along, young lady. She thinks you're going to throw her in jail. No. I'm not going to pinch your sister. You lost, you see. Mummy lost. Mummy lost. Probably swilling tea somewhere or else planted in a cinema. No. Mummy in London. Mummy got. I want my mummy. Oh, that's jolly. Now what do we do, Constable? Mummy said she's coming home for Christmas. And mummy not go. Poor little tight. Here, little girl. Little girl. What's your name? Well, look up at me. Here, let me let me see your face. What's the matter, sir? I have a hunch. Yes, sir. Now, don't let that kid get away. Here. What's she done, sir? I'll show you in a second. Look, keep her quiet, will you, before we run in. Stow it, you little darling. Oh! No, no, mustn't fight. Oh! Hurry up, sir, please. Oh, give her a sixpence or something. I'll find it in a minute. Ah, uh, here. Here it is. Look at it. Look at it. Now, don't let her see it. No lover, ruddy duck. You recognize the paper there? Of course, sir. We circulated thousands of these all over town. Well, tell me what it is. Oh, darling. Um, yes, sir, it's the picture of the missing woman that you people at Scotland Yard had made up. What else do you see? Sir? I said, what else do you see? Oh, this little maniac whose mother is missing, is the spitting image of the picture. All right. Come on, come on, darling. We'll take you home. My mummy come home? Now, dear, your mummy can't come home now. We accompanied the little girl whose name we learned was Iris Williams, age three, to her home, a short distance away. It was a modest three-room flat occupied by a Mrs. Jessie Fallowfield, the child's grandmother, and her son-in-law, Iris' father, a member of the local National Fire Service unit. Little Iris retreated to the doorstep with an enormous slice of bread and wild bramble jelly while Mrs. Fallowfield talked with us. Yes, I've been here only two weeks, you see. I didn't want to talk before little Iris. Her mother's away, my daughter. So we understand from Iris, Mrs. Fallowfield. Quite. I don't like to have to say it, but Jessie, my daughter, she has the same name as mine. And Peter, my son-in-law, didn't get on together. Where is your son? At the fire station. Uh-huh. Well, to speak quite plainly, my Jessie wrote to me at Seven Oaks in Kent, you know, that she couldn't stand it here with Peter any longer and she was going away. Well, how long ago was that? Well, the 19th of November. Uh-huh. You haven't heard from her since? Oh, yes, indeed, almost every week. You've heard from her since she left? Oh, yes. But we're on the best of terms as long as we're not together, you see. I'm afraid she's a bit flighty. Well, one can't live one's daughter's life, can one? No, no, one can't. And you say you've heard from her recently? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, the reasons I came from Seven Oaks to live here is because she wrote asking me to. She did? Yes, she insisted she couldn't live with Peter. But he needs to be taken care of, says she, and won't you go and make a home for him, Mother? So that's why I'm here. 
Peter just moved in with me a week ago. It's very cozy. Though I do wish she'd come home again. Though it would probably be the same thing all over again. Bicker, bicker, bicker. Oh, there's no peace in this world anywhere, is there? Well, uh... I'm sure we're very sorry to have bothered you, Mrs. Fallowfield, but we were quite captivated by little Iris. I do hope she didn't hurt you. Oh, I better make sure to come and fix that up, ma'am. Iris was quite upset that her mother hadn't come home for Christmas. Oh, my, yes. Though Jessie wrote both Peter and me saying she couldn't make it. She was so busy there in Hampstead, the Christmas rush and all. A hairdresser, you said? Yes, but I'm afraid I don't know the name of the place. Well, it doesn't really matter since you're sure it was your daughter's handwriting in that letter. Well, I should think I'd be able to recognize that handwriting of hers. <laughs> the hours I've spent trying to teach her to write tidily. <laughs> Well, I hope you'll pardon our intrusion, Mrs. Fallowfield. We were so taken with dear little Iris. Yes. And rather alarmed about her mother. Oh. And I'm afraid that we uh, police officers... Suspicious. I'm sorry. Well, there's nothing at all to worry about my daughter, gentlemen. I'm quite sure that she's safe. Oh, I'm quite sure of that, madam. But uh, her husband, your son. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's Peter now. Peter? Hello, Ma. There's another letter from Jessie here. Oh, I'm sorry. These gentlemen are from the police, Peter. The police? About Jessie? I'm happy to see you, Mr. Williams. Oh, I'm Chief Inspector Ford of Scotland Yard. What? What's this about Jessie? Oh, don't be alarmed, Peter. Iris was blubbering in the street about her mummy being lost... And these gentlemen were afraid murder has been done or something equally horrid and brought her home. Oh, well, well, thank you, gentlemen. Mother, I must have tea early. I'm fighting tonight. My son is a boxer. You're, you're a lightweight, I take it, Mr. Uh, Williams? Uh-huh. 135 pounds, yes. Didn't see your name on the card. At the drill hall, eh? Yes. Slasher Rifkin broke his wrist this afternoon. I'm a substitute. Oh, I shall probably see you then. Too bad about Slasher. Good man, that. Saw him fight that Australian four weeks ago. Oh, I've beaten him twice. He can't stand up against a left-handed boxer. You're left-handed? Yes. Another letter from Jesse Peter. Yes. The postman was just passing and he... Uh... That another example of your daughter's handwriting, Mrs. Fallowfield? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Did you ever see such writing? The girl will never learn. <laughs> Nobody could ever imitate that writing. Well, gentlemen, I'm sorry that you've had to get mixed up in all this. My wife's a very charming girl, but... Oh, you... well, we quite understand. I, uh, I hope you'll forgive our intrusion. Oh, it's all right. <coughs> Looked like your duty, I suppose. Another one of those unfortunate affairs. I'm sorry about it, but... Well, you're men of the world. You understand. Oh, oh yes, oh, absolutely. Quite, quite. It'll all come out right one of these days, I'm sure, though. It's all right, Mother Fallowfield. The gentleman, if you'll excuse me, I've got to have my tea now. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, so sorry to have disturbed you, sir, and uh, Mrs. Fallowfield. Oh, it's quite all right. Good night. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Now, Peter, would you fancy a nice kipper, perhaps? <coughs> well, <coughs> what did you think? Sir, I've done a bit of boxing in my time, too. What? One thing I learned many years ago. Yes? Never trust a left-handed boxer. I went back to London completely baffled at this turn of events that had suddenly reopened a case that should have been closed in that wintry little graveyard. Here was almost indubitable proof that the woman we had buried was still alive and in constant communication with her husband and her mother. The letter from her had arrived on the very day I had seen her body committed to the frozen ground. It was impossible, obviously. Out of my desk at Scotland Yard the next morning, I arranged to have every known hairdressing shop in Hampstead and the whole north of London investigated to find if any employed a girl named Jessie Williams or Jessie Fallowfield. I'd caught the return address on the envelope in the Fallowfield flat, and it said, Jessie Williams, Hampstead. Hampstead. Spelled that way, without the P. H-A-M-S-T-E-A-D. I remembered. Well, I thought she spells as badly as she writes. 
I dismissed it and picked up the telephone to make a routine inquiry. Criminal Records Office, Sergeant Healy. Healy, I'd like you to look up a chap for me, please. Who's this speaking, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Chief Inspector Ford. Yes, sir. Chap named Peter Williams, a boxer by profession, comes from Bedfordshire. See if we've ever had any dealings with him before, will you? Take some time, sir. Oh, good enough. Ring me when you find out, will you? Williams, Peter. That's all I know about him. We'll see what we can find, sir. All right. Thank you. I went upstairs to see Sir Brendan O'Neill, the home office pathologist. Hello, Oscar. Get her buried, all right? Yes, sir. Uh, sit down. But I want to dig her up again. What for, old boy? Can it be done? Well, of course, if there's sufficient reason. I need to know one or two things. Well, it's unusual, but... Uh... The case isn't closed yet, I saw to that. Well, if her relatives don't raise the row... We haven't been able to find any relatives, sir. Oh, that's right, isn't it? Well, in that case, dig her up. Right, sir. Then we can have her sent down here, and I'll need your personal assistance, Sir Brendan. For what? I want to find out some things. Well, I can't tell you her name, Oscar. Perhaps I can. Well, what do you want me to do, then? Help me to find a very clever murderer, sir. <laughs> These things happen during the next two days. First, a report from the officer in charge of checking the hairdressing establishments. We have checked every hairdressing shop in the entire north portion of London. The special reference to Hampstead, sir. 131 shops. Not one has any record of a woman named Jessie Williams or Jessie Fallowfield. There was only one Jessie among them all. A Mrs. Jessie Forrester, age 61. She was obviously not the person we was after. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. A report from the Criminal Records Office of Scotland Yard. Sergeant Healy speaking, sir. We checked thoroughly on your boxer, Peter, Peter Williams. Find anything on him? Yes, sir. He's been up twice. Convicted. Penal servitude in both instances. Good. That also? Yes. Oh, no. Uh, what was he charged with? Forgery, sir. A final visit to Sir Brendan O'Neill's laboratory. Here's the... Uh, here's the report, Oscar. She was struck twice on the head with a flat object, like a wide metal bar or a heavy, narrow wooden plank. The instrument was of an undetermined length, but the marks on the skull indicate that it was three and seven-eighths inches wide at the point where it was struck into the skull. Very good indeed, Sir Brendan. Uh, how about the other experiment? Well, they're still working on that. Ah, looks rather silly, doesn't it? I think you were right. Will you be able, do you think, to swear to it if, uh, if you find I'm right, sir? Well, if results continue this way, we shall. Uh, you sent for me, Sir Brandon? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you're Hayes, aren't you? Yes, sir. Mm. Right or left-handed, Hayes? Left-handed, sir. Good. Uh, over on that side, they'll call you when they're ready, Hayes. Uh, yes, sir. Would you like to take a little trip up to Bedfordshire with me, Sir Brendan? My constable friend from the tug-of-war team had briefed me on how to find the little house where the boxer Williams had lived with his wife, Jessie, before she went away, as he said, to Hampstead, before he had gone to live with her mother. It was a tiny cottage not far from his present flat. I noted with interest that one of the windows looked out onto the graveyard where we had buried that poor woman a few days before. We walked around the place, staring at the neat rooms, empty as they'd stood since Williams had moved out. There was nothing at all at first to excite our interest. Sir Brendan O'Neill walked into the tiny stone-floored scullery. I watched with the other Scotland Yard man who'd come with us. Sir Brendan spoke from the other room. Uh, this might be it, Oscar. Uh, this strip of wood on this old bench here. Uh, measure it. Three. Three and seven eighths inches, all right. Well, right width, Oscar. Good. It's been nailed on fairly recently, sir. These are new nails. Mm, see if you can get it off. Uh, carefully. Oh, I can do it. Hand me the parcel, Oscar. What's that, sir? It's a skull. 
Never mind it. The, uh, the piece of wood. You've been here before, madam. Fits the scars perfectly, Oscar. I think we've got... That him? Right inside, Mr. William, if you please. That's him. Back here in the scullery, Constable. Right, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Hello, Inspector. Ford, Scotland Yard, sir. I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Why, we'll try to show you, Mr. Williams. I really haven't much time. I... <laughs> now, that's enough, Constable. What? A few things, Mr. Williams. Now, what's the name of that place that your wife writes to you from? Why, Amstead. How do you spell that? Why, H-A-M-S-T-E-A-D. How interesting. That's the way it's spelled on those letters from your wife, isn't it? Isn't that right? I, that's the way I always spelled it. I Exactly. This object is the skull of a woman. Shall we say, uh, resembled your wife in many ways? I don't know. I... May I have the club, Sir Brendan? Thank you. This heavy plank, which is been once removed from this stool here and been replaced, fits the scars on the skull exactly. You see? Now, look here, I don't know about... Watch him, that. Constable. I'm watching him, sir. And Sir Brendan O'Neill here conducted certain experiments with this poor relic of the woman who so closely resembled your wife, Mr. Williams. A large number of men... 141. 141 men struck at this skull which was placed where a standing woman's head might be. What is this nonsense? I'm afraid it's far from nonsense, Williams. <gasps> None of the right-handed men were able to strike the skull at all in the region of the scars. But every left-handed man could. Steady, lefty. Peter Williams, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder of your wife, Jessie Williams. And I warn you that anything you may say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. You wish to make a statement at this time? The evidence was incontestable. At the trial, the testimony of handwriting experts proved that Williams had written the letters purposely coming from his wife after her death. The days on which these letters had been posted were in every case the days on which Williams had been off duty the only days on which he had been able to go to London for that purpose. It was demonstrated in court that only a left-handed man could have struck the fatal blows. The testimony of more than a dozen acquaintances of the couple provided the motive for the murder. And in a dramatic break with his counsel in open court, Williams shouted out his confession that he had indeed committed the brutal murder. He was sentenced to be hanged, and the sentence was executed on May Day, 1944. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed, otherwise the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. NBC. 